We'll do a quick prayer before we begin. Christos anesti eknekron thanato thanaton patisas ketisendis mnimasin Zoin Charis Amenos Αναστάσω Ιησούς από του τάφο καθώς προείπεν έδωκεν ημίν την αιώνιον ζωήν και μέγα έλεος Having beheld the resurrection of Christ let us worship the Holy Lord Jesus the only sinless one We venerate your cross, O Christ and your holy resurrection we praise and glorify For you are our God, we know none other than you We call on your name, come all you faithful let us venerate Christ's holy resurrection for behold, through the cross, joy has come into all the world. Let us ever bless the Lord, praising his resurrection. For by enduring the cross for us, he has destroyed death by death. Christos Anesti. Please be seated. Uh, before we begin, I'll ask for a favor. Does anybody have a watch or a phone I can keep track of time on? So I don't keep you guys until uh, 1, 1.30? Because if I had the chance, I would keep you until that late. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. So today's our, our last gathering of the ministry year. We're going to finish the liturgy today, God willing. And uh, who knows what next year will bring. So I congratulate all of you for being here and running the good race, as St. Paul says. So last uh, month, we talked about the section before Holy Communion, which centers around the Lord's Prayer. So there was a prayer before the Lord's Prayer, which kind of shows us that now the attention of the liturgy is changing from offering the gifts to receiving the gifts. And one of these things that we talked about was the unity of faith that we need. And not only should we be united amongst ourselves in brotherhood and, and in a social way, but also in our faith. It's a unity of faith. And we all share that same faith of our Orthodox Church. And that's very important as we prepare for Holy Communion. Then we talked about the Lord's Prayer itself and how it's part of our preparation for Holy Communion. In their liturgy, we're told to pray with boldness to the, the Lord's Prayer. That we should be bold and ask God for the things that we need in order to make us worthy to receive communion. In this prayer, we also call God Father. And this was very important. And uh, we have become, because we've become His children. We call Him Father because we are His children. And we have become His children through Christ Himself, who became one of us so that we, He could unite us to Him and make us sons and daughters of God just as he is. After the Lord's Prayer, the priest tells us to bow our heads. And we bow our heads to receive the blessing of God through the priest. And uh, then uh, we pray that God will bless us as we depart and return into the world. And our protection and salvation, which we're praying for, comes through the reception of the mysteries of Holy Communion. Finally, we talked about the last prayer of preparation and the priest lifting up the amno, lifting up the bread, and the body of Christ, and saying, let us be attentive, the holy gifts are for the holy. And, the, and when the priest says this, he's not only saying it to the saints, to people who are actually holy, because otherwise none of us would receive communion, priests included, but he's saying, he's calling all of us who are struggling in our faith, struggling for holiness, struggling for perfection, even if we haven't reached it. So the priest then begins to prepare the gifts uh, for the distribution, which is what we'll talk about today. So, after what we just discussed takes place, when the priest lifts the body of Christ and says the holy gifts for the holy, he puts it back on the paten, the discarion, the tray, and he breaks it into four pieces. The people respond to the priest. Remember, he just said the holy gifts are for the holy. And we, or you the people, respond, one is holy, one is Lord, Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So, after the priest calls forward, the holy to receive the mysteries, the people kind of react as if to say, 
well, no, we're not holy. There's only one holy one. Only one person is holy, and that is Jesus Christ, and he is God, and for the glory of his Father. If we are holy, in other words, we are holy because we are united to him in holy communion. St. Nicholas Cavasilas uses the imagery of mirrors reflecting the sun. He says, For no one has holiness of himself. It is not the consequence of human virtue, but comes to all from him and through him. In other words, we're not holy on our own. It comes from God. And he continues and says, It's like if we were to place mirrors beneath the sun. So now imagine we just had a bunch of mirrors underneath the sun. Each mirror would shine and send forth rays of light so that one would think there were many suns. So in other words, if we, saw, if we only saw the mirrors, we would think, oh, that there are many suns. He says, yet, in truth, there is only one true sun which shines in everybody. In the same way, Christ, the only Holy One, pours himself on the faithful and shines in so many souls and gives light to many saints. Yet he alone is holy in the glory of God the Father. So just as in the same way the mirrors reflect the sunlight, we are reflecting God. The light is not of our own light, but God gives us that light and we reflect it into the world. So as the people now are chanting this hymn, the priest continues to assemble, so to speak, for lack of a better term, uh, the gifts for distribution to actually give the Holy Communion to the people. So if you remember, we spoke about this at the very beginning and even last year in our sessions. The amno, the body of God, as we say, the piece of bread that becomes is transformed into the body of God, has a seal on it. And on that seal is a cross with the letters Isus Christos Nika within the four. Imagine now a square with a cross in it. There's four quadrants. So each quadrant has two letters, I-C, X-C, N-I-K-A. So the priest breaks along those lines to make the four pieces of the communion. And he uh, places them on the paten, on the disc, on the discarion, on the tray, in the shape of the cross. So as he's breaking the body, the amno, he says this prayer. The Lamb of God is broken and distributed, broken but not divided, eaten yet never consumed, sanctifying those who partake of it. So I'll, I'll, let me repeat that one more time. It says, The Lamb of God is broken and distributed. Broken, but not divided. Eaten, yet never consumed. Sanctifying those who partake of it. So what is this, what is this prayer saying? What does this mean? <clears throat> what it's saying is that even though the Holy Communion, the body of Christ, the bread, is broken into many small pieces and given to the faithful, to receive in their own bodies, Christ himself is not divided or consumed in the gifts, in the reception of the gifts. He gives us his body and blood without himself being diminished. So it's not as if we eat a part of Christ and then like part of him is missing. And that's not how this works. So another analogy given to us by the fathers is St. John Chrysostom who compares it to a, a fire. And he says, let us suppose there is one source of fire. So we have one flame. And from it are lit 10,000 lamps, or twice that number, he says. This is in your packet, by the way, in your sheet, by the way. So imagine one fire lighting 10,000 fires, or 20,000, he says. Does not the fire remain integ integrally the same, despite having passed on its energy to so many lamps? So even though the fire gives its energy to so many new fires, itself, it, it is not changed. And in the same way, Christ is the source of spiritual fire, which is in no way diminished by being passed on to others, but remains complete in himself, while forever welling forth and imparting good things to all. So it's not like we can run out of Christ. That's basically what it's saying. Even though we are eating his body and drinking his blood, he never runs out. It is an immortal and an eternal stream of, of life-giving mysteries. Also, we can say that each individual piece of communion is not only a part of Christ. Remember, it says broken but not divided. So we don't receive a part of Christ. We receive Christ in his fullness. Even if you have one little crumb of Holy Communion, you're receiving all of Christ. It's like when we take communion to the sick people at home. We don't cut a big piece for them. They receive maybe a crumb, maybe a little crumb of communion. 
But even that is Christ in His fullness. So now, as we move on. So after breaking the Amno, now he has it in four different pieces. The priest takes the piece with the Isus, the IC on it, and he places it into the chalice. So now the first piece goes into the chalice. Saying the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's the prayer that he says as he places, as he places the piece in there. We've mentioned before that in Holy Communion and in the liturgy, we receive the Holy Spirit who descended to make the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And so the Holy Spirit is still working, even though it's not like he comes down and then does his job and leaves. He's still present with us, and uh, especially during the rest of the liturgy as well. Also in the prayers we've discussed, we see many times that we pray to receive the Holy Spirit in communion. So that's why the priest says the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It's not only that we receive Christ, but we also receive the Holy Spirit. The priest then blesses the hot water, the altar boys heat the water up and they fill up the little uh, cup that they, we use. And then they bring it to the priest and he blesses it, saying, "The fervor, uh, Blessed is the fervor of your saints. And then he pours it into the chalice. And he says, as he's doing that, he says, The fervor of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, the Holy Spirit being referenced as we make the Holy Communion, so to speak. Why hot water? Let's ask that question now. Why hot water? So in the water, we are reminded of Christ on the cross. So if you guys recall, just a few weeks ago, we were hearing the stories of Christ's crucifixion. He, after he has died, and the pilot asks, oh, are they already dead? And what does he do? He sends a soldier to see if they're already dead. And so they break the legs of the first, and they break the legs of the thieves on the side. But Christ, they think he's already dead. So what do they do? They pierce his side with a spear to see if he's dead, and out comes what? You guys remember what the story says? Blood and water. So we add the water, even though water is added at the very beginning as well, we add the water again here uh, to the chalice. And why does it have to be hot? What is the significance of the heat? Besides that it makes it easier to consume, being warm, uh, for practicality's sake, there's also uh, the warmth of the water reminds us again of the Holy Spirit. If we think about Pentecost, the story of Pentecost, it says that the Holy Spirit came down in what form? In the form of fire on top of the apostles. And it overshadowed them with the fire. And then they were able to speak different languages. And they went on to become the true apostles at that point. So the heat of the water reminds us of the fire of the Holy Spirit. Also, we find in the book of Revelations this very interesting quote. And Christ tells us to be like hot water. The last thing Christ wants us to be is lukewarm. So if, this is in your packet as well. So this is Christ speaking in Revelations. I know your works, that you are neither hot, cold nor hot. So now he's rebuking these people for being neither cold nor hot. They're just lukewarm right in the middle. He says, I wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. It's like, imagine, think about water. I always think about water. I either want to drink water cold, like cold, refreshing water. I want it hot, like tea to make tea or to make coffee or whatever. Lukewarm water, for me, is not very enjoyable. So in the same way, this is now Christ saying about our spirits, I would, it's better to be, it's the best to be hot. If you're not hot, don't be lukewarm. Because I will spit you out of my mouth. This is what Christ is saying. Very interesting in the book of Revelations. In, in other words, he's saying it's even better to be cold towards God than it is to be in the middle, lukewarm. But if we find ourselves in that lukewarm state, just know and have faith that God is trying to heat us up, so to speak. He's trying to, with his Holy Spirit, to put us in that category of the hot water and the useful water. So this is why we use the hot water in the divine liturgy. So... At this point, the priest says the pre-communion prayers. And these are the same ones that the people say before receiving communion. I believe the Lord and I confess. The priests, they all say this together. He bows three times to the altar table after finishing these prayers and says, O God, be gracious unto me, a sinner, and have mercy. And then turns to the people and asks for their forgiveness. The clergy receive communion then in the ancient way. In other words, the priest takes the piece of communion in his right hand and consumes it directly into his mouth. He does not use a spoon to receive the body, and he drinks three sips directly from the chalice. He does not use a spoon for that either. 
And in the ancient church, this was how the whole community receives communion. Uh, the people would come forward and they would receive a piece of, of the body of Christ in their right hands and they would eat it. And then they would go to the chalice and they would drink directly from the cup as well. The spoon doesn't really begin to be used until the 8th century, so the 700s, so to speak. And then it's not really universal until the 11th century. So it's only been for about half of the history of our church that we've actually used the spoon to give Holy Communion. That being said, it's still been a thousand years, so I don't see it changing anytime soon. Uh, after receiving communion, meaning the priest, uh, with the other clergy, the priest places the remaining pieces of communion into the chalice and cleans the andimension. The andimension, if you guys remember, is the cloth that goes under the chalice and the viscarion, uh, to, and it catches any particles that fall. So the priest will clean it at that point. Finally, the priest now having everything ready, he covers the chalice with the maktro, with the red cloth, and he turns to the people and says, with the fear of God, faith and love approach. With the fear of God, faith and love approach. So why is fear, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing to hear fear, you know, come with fear. You know, are we, should, be, should we then be afraid of God in our life? And I'll quote here St. Isaac the Syrian, who compares the spiritual life to a ship sailing the seas. So now he's comparing being a Christian to being on a boat sailing over the ocean. This is in your uh, quote sheet as well. So St. Isaac says, Repentance is the ship, fear is its helmsman, meaning the captain, and love is the divine harbor. So fear places us in the ship and takes us of repentance, and then repentance, repentance takes us across the solid sea of life and brings us to the divine harbor, which is love, to which all those who are weary and heavy laden attain through repentance. So because of our fear of God, we repent, we cross the stormy seas of life, and we come to God, the port of God's love. And St. Isaac finishes his quote by saying, once we arrive at love, once we reach the port, we have arrived at God. So in other words, fear is the first step towards God, typically. In the Bible, in the, in the Bible we hear many times, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So there is this emphasis on fear being the beginning. Now, it's just the beginning, though. It's not as if we should be cowering to God, worried like the ancient Greeks were, that God was going to strike them with a lightning bolt. The ancient Greeks, everything they did was to avoid being destroyed by the gods. That's not our relationship with God. Fear is the beginning, but it's not the end. Uh, if you see in icons of St. Anthony many times, he's holding a scroll, and on this scroll, St. Anthony, of course, was the first uh, monastic that ever lived. He spent 80 years living in the desert. And on this scroll, it says, I no longer fear God, but love him. So just as in St. Isaac, the fear is the first step, but the final destination is love. And that's where we should reach uh, with God as well. And by the end of our lives, we should burn with love towards God instead of fear. And it's that love that unites us to him permanently and eternally. So that's why we highlight fear and love in this. As the priest brings out the chalice, he highlights fear and love. After the people receive communion then, with the spoon of course, the priest says the following prayer. Lo, this has touched your lips, and your iniquities are cleansed, and your sins are purged. Lo, this has touched your lips, and your iniquities are cleansed, and your sins are purged. This is a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, if you guys remember, we talked about Isaiah 6 when we were talking about the Trisagion prayer, the Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us, as well as the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord of Sabaoth, because those hymns come from this same section as well. So I'm going to refer to it again, because uh, it's very important to understand this passage if we want to understand what is happening when we receive Holy Communion. So in this chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah has a vision that he's in the temple of God. And he sees that God's majesty, God's glory, is filling the entire temple. And he says even the hem of his garment filled the temple. To show how great and how majestic God is. That even just, imagine like that, even just like the end of someone's dress or something, like a woman's dress, filling the entire temple. That's how the hem of God's garment fills the entire temple. Around God, he sees angels singing the thrice holy hymn, which we talked about earlier in previous sessions. And then Isaiah, 
who now finds himself in the presence of God, he cries out, saying, Woe is me! I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. It's almost as if he can't handle being in God's presence because he understands how sinful he is. And he said, that's why he says, I am a man of unclean lips. And so he's crying out saying, woe is me, I am ruined. So he's very distressed because of his sinfulness in the face of God, meeting God face to face. Now at this point of the story, an angel comes out of the temple, out of the altar of the temple. And he's holding in his hands tongs. Uh, and in that tongue is a burning coal, which he takes from the altar table. And he takes the coal in the vision and touches Isaiah's mouth with it. And the angel then tells him, Lo, this has touched your lips, and your iniquities are cleansed, and your sins are purged. So this is the same thing that the priest says after he gives the people communion. So let's then now compare the two situations. So this story of Isaiah 6 is an image of... The Divine Liturgy. It's an image of what happens in Holy Communion. Even though we are sinners, all of us are sinners, we find ourselves where? In the church, in the presence of God, in all His glory. <clears throat> we meet with Him and we stand with Him face to face. We realize our own sinfulness and unworthiness and we ask God to make us worthy. That's what we've been talking about. Make us worthy, make us worthy. We say it many times during the service. Then the priest comes out from the altar holding not the tongs, but the spoon, and holding not a coal, but holding the body and blood of Christ. By the way, an interesting note is that the word that we use for the spoon in the communion is la vida. Anybody know what the word la vida means? La vida means tongs. So la vida, the tongs, it's, it's a, to mirror Isaiah 6. So the priest really is not bringing out the spoon, he's bringing out the tongs holding the coal. But it's not the coal, it's the body and blood of Christ. This, we can say, is the why of the liturgy. We've been talking a lot about the what happens in the liturgy, and to a certain extent, the why. But this really is why we come here. This is why we're here. And I spoke a little bit about this in my sermon as well. We come here for the liturgy in order to meet God, to hear His Word, and to receive His Word into our own bodies, to be transformed purified and made divine, even godlike. So that's the point. That's why we're here, and that's why we come to the liturgy. So now, after the people receive communion, the priest exclaims, Save, O Lord, your people, and bless your inheritance. We can say, truly, we are saved by the mysteries. So the people then sing, We have seen the true light. We have received the heavenly spirit. We have found the true faith, worshiping the undivided trinity, for the Trinity has saved us. Father Lawrence Farley in his book about the liturgy explains that this hymn shows that our experience as Christians is one of being fulfilled by God. In Christ, he said, this is in your packet as well, in Christ, God fulfills everything. He gives everything to us and nothing remains to be done that is not already done. In other words, there's nothing left. God has done everything. We have seen the true light and have been enlightened. We have received the heavenly spirit and have been brought to heaven. We have found the true faith, and have been brought into the saving presence of the undivided Trinity. What more remains to be done? Through the Eucharist, Christ has accomplished everything for us. And so this hymn is an expression of that, to say God has done everything, and we have experienced everything in the liturgy. As the people chant this hymn, the priest places the gifts back on the altar and senses them with the censer, and he says three times, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. As he picks up the chalice and the paten again, so now he lifts them from the table and turns to the people, he says, Blessed is our God, in a low voice, you can't really hear that part, and then out loud for everyone to hear, Now endeavor into the ages of ages, Amen. And he takes the gifts and he puts them back on the proscomidi table, the table of preparation, which is on the side in the altar, where the gifts are prepared as well. After the small set of petitions which follow and the prayer of thanksgiving, the priest cries out, Let us go forth in peace. Let us pray to the Lord. And he recites the prayer behind the Amvo, which in former times was the final prayer of the liturgy. So that, that prayer, when the priest is standing in front of the icon of Christ, 
saying, uh, Lord, bless those who bless you and sanctify those who trust in you. That was, used to be the final piece of the liturgy. Uh, and it was said as the bishop was leaving the church. And he would stop in the middle of the church and he would say this prayer. And then he would walk out and the congregation would walk out behind him. Nowadays we say it in front of the icon of Christ and then we do the dismissal to dismiss everyone afterwards. So the prayer uh, it goes like this. It's said in front of the icon of Christ as I said. O Lord who blesses those who bless you and sanctifies those who put their trust in you. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Protect the whole body of your church. Sanctify those who love the beauty of your house. Glorify them in return by your divine power and forsake us not who have set our hope in you. Grant peace to your world, to your churches, to the clergy, to our civic leaders, to the armed forces and to all your people. For every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from you, the Father of lights. To you we give glory, thanksgiving and worship to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. In other words, in this prayer, we're asking, uh, as we're getting ready to leave the church now, we're asking for all the things that we need in order to shine the light of Christ into the darkness of the world. Earlier we talked about the mirrors in the sun. So now it's time as we leave the church to be that mirror, to shine the light into the world. And so we're asking uh, for, the, for, the help, uh, from, for God's help to, in order to do that. We hear in Matthew's Gospel, You are the light of the world. A town, a city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And that's supposed to be us. We, when it says a city on a hill cannot be hidden, the church is the city on the hill. And so when we leave the church walls, so to speak, we continue to be the church in the world. I'll we'll talk about that in just a minute. The priest gives the final blessing then and prays the dismissal. And in the dismissal, we ask for Christ to bless us and sanctify us. We ask for the Virgin Mary's intercessions and for all the saints for their guidance and protection as we leave and return to our homes. And so then, even we can say the departure, even leaving church, is part of the liturgy. And we'll tie, kind of tie this into what we were just saying. It's, we can think about all the processions we've talked about, coming to church, the small entrance, the great entrance, all these processions. This is like the last procession where we go from the church back into our homes and into our world. Our transformation that comes from meeting God, as we talked about, and welcoming Him into our bodies, should not only be effective while we're here in the four walls of the church. It's our calling to take these blessings and to go out <clears throat> and to go back into the world and show them. These blessings being forgiveness and a new life, that God has recreated us and made us new again. St. John Chrysostom explains, We should come out of the sacred assembly, meaning the divine liturgy, as if we have descended from heaven itself. We should come out of the sacred assembly as if we have descended from heaven itself. I think about, you know, as we leave our homes, do we do that? That's, that's the next step is asking ourselves, do we successfully do that? Or when we leave, or when we leave our church, do we go and begin the kutsobolyo? Uh, do we begin the uh, uh, fighting with each other, uh, the anger and animosity? Do we kind of return to our worldliness? Or do we, are we truly in a state of being in heaven or having come from heaven. If, as we said, the liturgy and receiving God's body and blood is supposed to change us, which we have talked about many times, then this change has to manifest itself in our everyday lives, not just here. In the words of Bishop Anastasios Yanulatos, who's the Archbishop of Albania, and he's doing very good things in Albania. And this is in your sheets. It's a very long quote, so I recommend following along. In his words, the liturgy has to be continued in personal, everyday situations. Each of the faithful is called upon to continue a personal liturgy on the secret altar of his own heart, to realize a living proclamation of the good news for the sake of the whole world. In other words, he's saying when we leave here, it's almost as if we take the liturgy with us. The liturgy should continue in our souls as we leave, and we should be proclaiming the good news for the sake of the world. He continues, without this continuation, the liturgy remains incomplete. Since in the Eucharistic event, meaning the liturgy, since in the liturgy we are incorporated in Him who came to save the world, we are united with Him who came to save the world, meaning Christ, and to be sacrificed for the world, 
we have to express in concrete ways, he uses the word diakonia, which means service, in concrete service, in community life, our new being in Christ. So if we are united with God in the mysteries, we have to show it in real ways in our communities about being a new person in Christ. The sacrifice of the Eucharist must be extended in personal sacrifices for the people in need, the brothers and sisters for whom Christ died. So he's saying the sacrifice that Christ made for us, we should be willing to make for others as well. Since the liturgy is for the participation of the great event of liberation from the demonic powers, to simplify that, meaning since the liturgy is in order so that we can experience liberation from the worldliness, from the evil powers that pull us down, then the continuation of liturgy in life means a continuous liberation from the powers of evil that are working inside us. A continual reorientation and openness to insights and efforts aimed at liberating human persons from all demonic structures of injustice, exploitation, agony, loneliness, and at creating real communion of persons in love. So if we were to digest that a little bit, he's saying, the liturgy then in our daily life should be a continual liberation. From what? From the powers of evil. And continually reorienting ourselves towards God and towards undoing these demonic structures of injustice, he calls. In other words, these things, injustice, exploitation, agony, so that the liturgy undoes these things, so that the liturgy overcomes these things in our world, and so that in our world we can have a unity of people in love. That's the true sign that the liturgy is affecting our hearts. And it's not that, oh, the priest didn't do it right, or the choir wasn't singing well that day, or the altar boys made mistakes. It's not magic. It's not a magic show. It's what is the state of our hearts? Are we accepting Christ in our hearts? Or are we rejecting Christ in our hearts, whether we know it or not? And so he's saying that if we are accepting Christ and going to the liturgy and experiencing the liturgy the way that we should, then it should absolutely impact our day-to-day -day lives and we should be completely united to one another. As Christ said, they will know that you are mine because you love one another. So as we leave today, with our last session of the ministry year, and we head to our homes, let's keep this in mind. Let's keep in mind that every day should be a liturgy, so to speak. Whether that's in the church, or whether that's a sense of, in our hearts, honoring God, making sacrifices for Him, the same way we honor Him and make sacrifices here in our church, so that He can heal us and transform us and sanctify us and unite Him to Himself. We should see ourselves as we leave the church as little Christs, as Christ in the world, that we are his very hands and feet, carrying the good news of healing, forgiveness, and salvation to everyone in the world. So, if we were to conclude the Divine Liturgy, the big, big takeaways. We've been now meeting for, this is the ninth session, so nine months we've been meeting. The big takeaways in the Liturgy, this is my point number one, in the Liturgy, we are in heaven, real heaven. Not, uh, we're not saying it as a, as a phrase or a turn of phrase. We are stepping into heaven, and we are in the presence of God himself, and the angels and the saints and his holy mother. In this meeting with God, number two. So in the liturgy, we are in heaven and we meet God. Number two, in this meeting with God, we hear his words, we receive his body and blood, and this experience transforms us and makes us holy. Number three, we are called to carry this new life that we receive from him into our day-to-day -day life. And number four, everything else that takes place in the liturgy, think about all the things we talked about, the hymns, the prayers, the actions of the priest, the altar boys, the vestments, the icons, architecture that we've we talked about last year, all of these other things, they point us back to that reality, that we are in the presence of God and that he's here to transform us. So everything else that we've discussed is pointing back to that, to those first three points. And that the purpose of the liturgy, which is to be transformed by being in the presence of God and taking that new life into the world uh, with us and shining Christ's light into the world. So with that, I thank you all for being here, for enduring my, uh, my uh, weaknesses and my sinfulness. 
And uh, at this time, if there are any questions, I can take a few questions. We have about three minutes left before it's time to do the next thing, which is the General Assembly. So, like I said, as we step out of the liturgy today, let's take, uh, take heaven with us even into the General Assembly today. It'll be a good test for all of us. So, Are there any questions before we conclude? Yes. yes. What, what makes this spoon practice start? Uh, I was, in one of my books I was reading, it said that there were abuses by the people, meaning they would take the communion, and instead of eating it, they would take it home with them. And they would eat it at home. Who knows what they would do with it? And so the church, as a reaction to that, started giving it in the, with the spoon directly into the people's mouths, because at that point, you can't take it home with you. You have to eat it right, right there and then. So that's the one thing I did find about why the transition happened was because of that. There were some uh, unfortunate situations among the people. So, yes. yes. This may be unintended, but when I walked towards the end of your presentation, you yes. referred to not a censor, but a, a, an instrument in translating to the Spanish. It translates to life. I don't know if you knew that. La vida? And I heard that. I, was, I listened to your That's, a, that's an interesting uh, connection. It's ironic that, you know, that in Spanish you're referring to life. Interesting, yeah. In the ancient Greek, the word la vida, y la vida is the tongs, which we were comparing to Isaiah, where Isaiah, the angel, brings the, tong the coal with the tongs. But his point was that in Spanish, la vida means life, which is, fits because it's Holy Communion, which is body and blood of Christ, which is our source of life. So thank you. It's a nice connection. Any other questions or comments as we wrap up? Okay, God bless. Thank you again. And... Uh, We'll see all of you inside for the General Assembly. <laughs> Oh,